I've got a staff and I've got a team and they're looking at me. And if I come in and I am moping and grouchy and pissed, they're going to be too. Instead, I want to greet them every day with a sense of optimism like, hey, I don't care how hard this challenge is that we're dealing with. We're going to figure it out and it's going to be awesome. And if you want to be a member of this elite high performing team, then that's the way you carry yourself and you work that down echelon with your folks too. So in order to participate, I'm pretty candid saying, I only want high performers on my team. Okay, welcome back or welcome to the Finding Mastery Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Gervais, by trade and training a high performance psychologist. And I am thrilled to welcome Vice Admiral John Mustin to the podcast for this week's conversation. What is it like to lead 59,000 people? What if those people are spread out all over the world? Chief of Navy Reserve or CNR, Vice Admiral John Mustin knows exactly what it's like. And he does it with a singular laser guided priority in mind, war fighting readiness. So what exactly does readiness look like? When it comes to performing at the highest level, Vice Admiral Mustin is steadfast in his belief that individual performance is informed by both competence and character. We'll find out how he helps instill these traits in his force and the challenges that come with it. Vice Admiral Mustin has an extraordinary grasp on leadership philosophy, communicating effectively across large organizations and using his civilian experiences to inform strategy within his military career. And he is generous enough to share his insights with us around both organizational and personal high performance. With that, let's dive into this week's conversation with the very impressive Vice Admiral John Mustin. Admiral, this is an honor, and I do not say that word lightly. And so thank you for being here. Thank you for in advance for bringing a um, generational type of insight and wisdom to this conversation. So I appreciate you. Well, I can't tell you how thrilled I am to be here. And as I mentioned, I've been a long-term listener or a long-time listener. So um, so this is kind of a, a big moment for me too. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Okay, good. So we're both in it. All uh -huh. right. All right, good. So let's start at the top. In your most succinct way, like what is the U.S. Navy Reserve and why is it important for us to understand the operations that you're running? Ah, great question. So the Navy Reserve is about 60,000 citizen sailors, as we, uh, as we describe them. And we're an augmentation force that makes our Navy more capable and have greater capacity in the event of peace or war. So at its most basic level, we were born prior to the nation's entry into World War I, so 1915. So we just celebrated our 108th anniversary. And in every significant conflict since then, the Navy Reserve has augmented the active duty force for our nation. In World War II, we had two million sailors that were reserve that, uh, that served in the Pacific and uh, in the Atlantic. So the nation has come uh, to expect that the Navy Reserve is not only ready to perform, but is qualified, certified, and able to mobilize when ready. So, so the missions that we're doing around the world, you know, I've got people in every time zone, uh, in every area of responsibility, every combatant command area that are serving right now. I mean, they're uh, around the world representing the interests of our nation. So it's important. In, in your organization, the reservist organization is civilian. Are they civilians or like, how does the the bifurcation work between being a um, sailor versus being a civilian? Sure. So of my 60,000, 10,000 are active duty sailors whose job is to train and administer the reserve force. The other 50,000 are called selected reserves. And those are the folks that you may know by the old bumper sticker of a weekend a month and two weeks a year. Mm -hmm. So we say, okay, that sums to 38 days. And it really uh, today does not need to be a week and a month or two weeks a year. You know, that's that's the minimum requirement. You may want to do two weeks at one time and then do another two weeks and then not come in for a couple of months. As long as it sums to that 38 days, then you get what's called a good year. But but the short answer is 10,000. So roughly, you know, 15 percent or 16 percent of my folks are there all day, every day. They are indistinguishable from an active duty sailor. But their focus and their job is to administer the reserve force. That number, 10,000 to the 60,000, mm -hmm. okay. Is that thoughtful or was did that happen by accident? 
Oh, it's incredibly thoughtful. Okay, pause the the rest right. of the answer because I one in five is where we've been working from. We found some research to be able to impact or create a critical mass across culture. We need at least one in five to be able to be like the heartbeat of what you're right. trying to create. And then I hear you say something very close to that, like one in six. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if like I'm not being or being too ambitious with the one of five, but tell me more about that. And if you agree yeah, with that idea yeah. that you need like one in five to be able to create the heartbeat or one in six in your turn. You bet. Um, and, I, and I don't want to make it sound too mathematical. So it's not that we have one out of every six in small units is. No, active. right. Yeah. It's so, from a, but from a broad stroke. Exactly. Like, right. um, for instance, I've got 115 reserve centers. They're staffed by my active duty reserve sailors. So typically um, staffs of between 11 and 40, and, and they are civilian and active duty reserve. Okay. And they manage a selected reserve population that could be up to 1,500. So, so we do track that ratio very carefully. That will never be one in six. That's more like one in 30. Mm -hmm. but, but that's what we found to be manageable at the reserve center level. My staff at the Pentagon, 55, all, we call them training and administration of reserve. We call them TAR. So all TAR sailors. My reserve forces command down in Norfolk, uh, one of my Echelon 3 commands for folks who know what that means. Uh, that's 100% TAR staff as well. And and then scattered throughout my operational units. So again, of the 60,000, 30% we call operational units. Those are small boat units. Those are expeditionary medical facilities, cargo handling battalions, Navy SEALs. Those are also populated heavily with tar sailors because they need to be there every day and they need to make sure that they're taking care of the training and the certifications, the, regi the regiments, the equipment and things that, um, that you just can't do if you're showing up only on the weekend. Okay, do you think that one in five or one in six um, from a heartbeat to get cr to create change in a culture. Do you think that that's close? Does that intuitively feel right uh, to it, you? It does intuitively. intuitively. And, and, and just from an organizational behavior perspective, it sure does. Yeah. The, the way I look at it, though, is I scrutinize every billet and every sailor across our force as part of a pretty rigorous what and is it, what iterative. Is billet? Sorry. Uh, billet is a specific job. Okay. So yeah. you scrutinize every every billet. And every unit. Okay. Okay. So a unit is essentially a company and the billet is the job. But I, I look at every one of those because part of my job as the chief of the reserve force is to augment or improve, optimize our force design, which is what is our capability and what's our capacity? So, so what do we do and how much of it can we do? So I've made trades over the last three years where I've said there are some things that we are no longer going to do but I will harvest those billets or units to build up additional capacity in the things that we know we must do. And that's been part of a pretty generational transformation where we've said legacy functions that made a lot of sense in the global war on terror post 9-11, which by the way, non-maritime, okay? So, so we were providing uh, support to joint force requirements in the deserts. That's not why the Navy exists. Right. So, so part of my charter right. when I came in was, we're going to modernize the reserve force. And what that really means is review, audit, assess, determine what is the utility of every one of our sailors and what are they doing? And so in many cases, I said, we know that we need more capability in Navy special warfare, our, our SEAL friends, the SEAL enablers. We need more there. That's a capacity and a capability that is in demand by our fleet commanders. I need more capability in space, space capability, cyber. Those are areas of growth for us. Expeditionary logistics, this is another one where if we're going to uh, be drawn into conflict in the Indo-Pacific region, in all likelihood, it's going to look a lot like it did in the war in the Pacific in World War II. Picture Guadalcanal, island hopping campaigns. We've got great reserve capacity there. In fact, there are seven cargo handling battalions in the Navy. Six of them are reserve force. So I'm saying maybe we need more. That could be something that would be tremendously in demand, and we should probably grow capacity there. So capacity yeah. and capability, this is these, these two words I'm very familiar with from a sport sure. and human sure. per, uh, yeah. development perspective. I'm not sure everyone, I'm not sure the, the, the community fully embraces those two. But so capacity and capability, they work together, but they're very different. Absolutely. And when I think about capability, I think, what are you capable of doing or what are we capable of doing? Right. 
And that for me like points to skill mostly. Yes. But what is yeah. it for you as well? Well, it's it's skill, but it's also training and qualification. Okay, right. And I would say those lead up to the be the ability to be able to express a skill. Exactly. And then ex exactly. express a skill on demand under duress is like that's what I'm most yeah. interested in in high speed accurate environments. Exactly. Right. Okay. And then capacity means something different. And so how do you think about capacity? So capacity, you know, I, and again, the, the easy way is, okay, capability is what we do. Capacity is how much of it can we do? That's right. So so we talk about watch teams. You know, essentially, if you think of uh, a football game, okay, you got your starting team. Well, if you're going to, if everybody gets hurt and you have to roll in with the second string, okay, that's the second team. The Navy operates around the clock, around the world. And so typically the active duty manpower design accounts for daytime operations. But if we're drawn into conflict like we're seeing in Europe right now, we're going 24-7. Mm. So the reserve force comes in and we're watch sections two and three if you picture an eight-hour workday. So, so the capacity that we bring is the ability to supplement from daytime operations to 24-7 operations. How about that? Okay. Yeah. So – so it's not like you're waiting around in a lounge, like waiting no, for no, some like no, no. somebody it's like you're like in sweatpants training all the time. That's a terrible idea. But like it's I not sure you that's not that's the visual not that I have when I think of our training. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So um, so th like there's a active readiness for um, two and three on a, on a 24 hour clock. Absolutely. Three segments. You are responsible for two and three readiness. Yes. So if something strikes at, at 11 p.m., you're up. We would be on the watch floor already. On the watch floor yeah. already, because you're already there. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Now that that's even better. Okay. And you mentioned the what did you call it? The Indo Pacific. Indo Pacific. Yeah, that's the area of the world. It's hot there now. It is. Yeah. And so I think we're all watching, and I'm not asking you to say anything out of turn here. If something were to happen in that mm -hmm. region, what would the picture look like from a global perspective about uh, responding to that call? Globally, for the for all of our services, it would be massive, and then I can get more granular about the Navy. But but I can assure you, if something happened in the South China Sea or in the Strait of Taiwan, or in the East China Sea or the Philippine Sea, it, it would be massive on a scale that we haven't seen since World War II, and and it would have global economic impacts before we even get into kinetic issues or um, or collateral damage. I mean, you know. There are certainly scenarios where we see, depending on what exactly it is we're talking about, um, if it's gray zone conflict and and to oh, gray zone. differentiate what like, that is. So so if we think of conflict as being binary, we're either in peace or war. Mm. Uh, what we find is that's never really the case. Have we so always been in gray? Since since you've been alive, I've been alive. Uh, mostly with the advent of cyber and social right. and other uh, information warfare capabilities, which means. It's below the threshold of armed conflict, but it's still conflict. Yeah, you know, right. we, you know, we see intrusion on our networks every day, and so again, that that is not necessarily attributable. And even if it is, we're not going to go to war because of that. So we refer to that as gray zone, where you say, um, you know, again, if peace is white and war is black, kind of we're operating in a gray zone in a lot of domains. Now, you know, we refer to domains as under the sea, on the sea, over the sea, cyber, space. Those are all referred to as domains. So, so we recognize. Wait, do that, that again. That was fun. Under yeah. the sea, <laughs> on, the, on sea, the sea, over the sea. And you're, are you, you have that. that full that's stack. the Navy. Oh yeah, absolutely. you're the full stack. You bet. Yeah. yeah. And does e does each vertical in military operations have that full stack, or the Navy uniquely has that full stack? Um, each of the services has a component. A component to it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But and the but Navy world, runs the vessels. Uh, sure. So, so we on the sea. You could be a surface warfare officer. So we're on the surface of the ocean. Uh, interestingly, the army has boats, destroyers, too. carriers. It'd be cruisers. weird if like your family name had a destroyer. <laughs> Wouldn't that be interesting? That Could would you be amazing. imagine? That would be amazing. that would be amazing if like your family. <laughs> and what if there was two? Absolutely. Yeah, that would that would be something. What okay. if there was one guy who had two named after him? Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. <laughs> okay, I can't wait to go back to that to that part of the story. Okay, okay. so there's a full stack. You're under yeah. the sea, on the sea, over the sea. So, which is air. so submarines, ships, airplanes. Okay. And then cyber, right? And space. And space. So satellites. And are you managing are you managing um responsibility, capabilities and capacity across all of those? I am. 
Yes. Yeah. So you, so, you can't but, just like. But di to differentiate when, when we say manage. Okay. So, so I provide the forces. So I'm a service provider. So I make sure that we have the units, the billets, the people trained and certified so that the active duty commanders can task them. So I, I'm not an operational commander. Uh, right. But, right. but I am a service component that delivers uh, people. Okay, this is, but this is why I wanted to speak to you. This, sure. th at this very intersection about, you have a service, your service is primarily people, and scaling leadership, being able to cascade ideas, to create a heartbeat where people see themselves in an important mission and they're an important part in it, or an important purpose, and they see themselves yeah. in that, that is, challenging that challenges the best of leaders and so i don't know if you're working from like a model or you've been figuring it as you go and you've got a you know you got three or four generations of is it four generations of, um actually more than that but yeah four from the naval academy four from the naval academy yeah. generational and maybe just walk us through that like it's great grandfather sure, sure. Uh, so my great grandfather henry was class of 1896 and his son my grandfather lloyd was class of 1932 and then his son, my father Henry, was a class of '55. And for good measure, for good measure, his brother Tom, my uncle, was a class of '62. And then I was class of '90. But, but if you go on my grandmother's side, then there were several others as well. But uh, I won't complicate things. With no. Yeah. yeah. So, so you, there's a bit of a baton passing. Whether yeah. it's, I mean, I wonder how the DNA works here. But like, there's a baton passing, certainly of young. Um, dining room, breakfast table conversations that I would never yeah. have been exposed to, yeah. like that you and your family were getting early on. And so bef before we go to that part of it, though, how do you think about leadership at scale? And, and I don't want to, I don't want to taint it in any kind of way. And I don't want to even butcher it by saying leadership at scale. Right. So like, how do you respond to that? Well, I, I think what you're getting at is an important topic, which, which I've always viewed as the more senior we get, you know, yes, we're still leaders, but the leadership requirements and demands change. You know, as a young officer, you're a leader from the first day you join the Navy, but you may be leading a division and that may be 15 people. That's certainly different than being the commanding officer of a destroyer with 350 people or being a strike group commander with 10,000 people or being the chief of the reserve force, you know, with 60,000. And and the Navy is pretty smart about this, and we invest in leadership training. So we've got what we refer to as our continuum of leadership training. So we give you essentially unit level training when you're young, and then you get to be a mid-grade or field officer, you get additional different training. And then you get an executive level training. And then when you become a flag or a general officer, you get different training. Uh, I mean, I would tell you when I was a one-star admiral, the training was different than it was for a two-star admiral. And then as a three-star admiral, we're exposed to a really unique uh, series of training opportunities that, that talk about organizational change and talk about large-scale dynamics and you know, basic things about, okay, not only establishing a vision, but how do you communicate it? And what do you do from the ground up versus from the top down? And you know, are you inspiring and rallying people or are you holding people to the line? I mean, what, how do you cultivate your personal leadership style? You know, in my view, I've always said it's hard to argue with results. And, and there have been occasions when I've said, hey, I tried this and it was less effective than this other technique, which worked very well. And so, you know, the Navy in many ways is a large institution, all total, active and reserve, over 400,000 folks. But, but we are very entrepreneurial as a service. So let's do that. Let's talk about some frameworks yeah. that make sense to you. And then mm -hmm. I also want to double, double click on the idea of like how to help create a yeah. vision and then cascade that vision. Cause that's a super practical and I'll tell you how I do it. Sure. Um, not at the scale, of course you're doing yeah, yeah. it, but wait, are there models that you could, that you think through that have been meaningful to you when it comes to leadership? Um, there certainly are. I mean, I, there are some that we, I would look at as a problem solving framework. I mean, we use something called Demaic. I don't know if you're familiar I don't know with it, Demaic. No. Yeah. So, yeah. um, make sure I look that up. Well, and, and it's interesting that, um, that this is something that we are investing heavily in training all levels of our teams. I mean, from the most senior person to the most junior person. And that, that framework is important to us because, again, as it relates to problem solving, I just don't feel like we've got the time or the bandwidth to flail. You know, we want to be ruthlessly efficient in addressing the root causes of problems in ways 
that is commonly understood. So in my case, what I tell people is, here's how I want to take a brief. You know, I have some basic expectations before we sit down to talk about an issue. And, and I want the problem statement to be explicitly stated. Because what I've learned over the years is, sometimes I get a 40-page PowerPoint deck that talks about all the reasons that the world is hard, and yet there's nothing actionable in there because they're trying to boil the ocean. Instead of saying, the root cause problem is the following, and there are 10 stakeholders involved, this is what is required to fix it, here's where I need your help, or I don't need your help, but I want you to know what we're doing. And, and after agreeing on the problem statement, like a lot of times we don't get past that first slide because I'll say, I don't think you put enough effort in the problem statement. No, so, to, and that is drilling down to the, to the, the central, root cause. The yeah, root cause. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and not treating the surface symptoms, which it's easy for us to leak, leap into activity and say something broke, slap some duct tape and bubble gum on it and declare victory. When in fact, what we really need to do is think about why did this happen and what was it systemically? You know, in many cases, when we're talking about human beings, there's a degree of variability that we have to accept. But I always look at it as kind of the owner of the system to say, what could I have done differently to either train or enable the people to perform better? That's your central question. That's that my question. Asked, well, right? I, I look in the mirror every day and say, okay, someone, it would be easy for someone to say this sailor did something stupid and we should throw the book at him. My first thought is, what could I have done differently that might have prevented the decision that that person made? And again, I, I just, I agree, or I assume that no one wakes up saying today I'm going to do dumb things. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So, and, and I don't think people are the um, villain in their no, own story. No, of course. Yeah, right. Of course. Do you, do you think yeah. people are fundamentally good? I do. You do. Yeah. Not this. So that's refreshing for me to hear because you and I have both seen people do some of the most absolutely egregious, like I'm even a loss for words thinking about like some of the things that I've experienced and seen and heard secondhand that people are struggling with. Um, in both elite in performing environments as well as you know something something different than that. So, so how do you, how do you come to that idea that people are fundamentally good? On one hand, I may be naively optimistic. Um, are you? An on, on you the, are an optimist. I am absolutely. Yeah, me because, too. As well. But I wake up and I and I think to myself, okay, today I get to make some decisions. One is, am I looking for the good in this day, or am I looking to complain about all the things that are difficult in the day? And so the other thing that I realize is I've got a staff and I've got a team and they're looking at me. And if I come in and I am moping and grouchy and pissed, they're going to be too. Instead, I want to greet them every day with a sense of optimism like, hey, I don't care how hard this challenge is that we're dealing with. We're going to figure it out and it's going to be awesome. And if you want to be a member of this elite high performing team, then that's the way you carry yourself and you work that down echelon with your folks too. So in order to participate, you know, I'm, I'm pretty candid saying, I only want high performers on my team. And granted, in the Navy, sometimes we are forced because of timing and, you know, uh, inventory issues. You don't always get to pick everybody that you work with. But my expectation is we're starting from an, from an, uh, an opening salvo where I say, welcome to the team. It's a pleasure to meet you. And I greet everyone on my staff uh, within the first week of their arrival. And I sit down with them and say, okay, you're coming to work in my manpower shop. Thrilled to see you. Your reputation precedes you. I've read your biography. I got a couple of questions about where you live and what are your interests. Just so you know, you're relieving a person who was the best in this job that I've ever seen. And my expectation is you're going to be better than him. And if that doesn't sound good to you, then now's the time to mention it to me because I can find you another job. But my hope is that you're going to fit in and you're going to pick up that baton and run fast. And then honestly, everyone says, I can't wait to contribute, sir. I mean, I've never had anyone go, you know what? I thought maybe I don't want to be here. <laughs> so, so that's interesting. So that's a, yeah. so we've got a model that we work from support then challenge. Right. You're coming right out the gate with a challenge, with a standard. Maybe it, it is. And then so how do you think about that idea, support then challenge? I, I like it very much. You I do mean, like yeah, it? Yeah. In, in fact, I always, I, I describe this uh, approach when I do um, meetings with my team, when, when they're new, when we do kind of an indoctrination period, mm -hmm. I, I'll say, here's what you can expect from me. I, I am going to envision, enable, and encourage you. That, that, so Envision, we'll, enable, encourage. Encourage, yeah. So we're going to talk about what we want to achieve. hold on, hold on. <laughs> Admiral, where'd you, because that is like, that's something that, I don't like the word enable for me personally, 
but um, the envision and encourage bit is so so right down the center of, of how I've operated, it, almost intuitively. I don't have a model for that. I, I mean, I made it up, so, you did, so yeah. I will give it to you. No, yeah, well, I want you to use this. <laughs> I, great. <laughs> yeah. But it feels, yeah. for me right now, hearing that from you, it's like I, I feel not validated. That's not the right word, but I feel like I've been doing this part right. You know, right. So I, I really appreciate that you're doing sure. it that way. So the envision and then the encouragement part, I really get. And I want to hear how you think about enabling. Sure. So enabling is I, I'm going to give you the tools you need, the training. You know, what does that mean? Hey, in some cases, it's it's the hardware. It's the connectivity. If you're going to be in the field, you need to be able to communicate. I mean, that's that's a non-trivial task. So so the enabling piece that's is enabling. in order for you to do your job, I don't want you to say I had a million great ideas and I was ready to go, but the system didn't allow me to do what I wanted to do. So that's that's the enabling part. Okay. Uh, the encouragement can be problematic for me in my own head when it's not authentically sharp as well. Like I want, so encourage is not like pat on the back. Encouragement for me also is, wait, you can go a little further. You oh, can do, yeah. you can go a little deeper. Yeah. You know, you can stand your ground a little more clearly or kindly. Sure. Whatever. Like, sure. Is, is there a sharp edge to encouragement? There is. It's, okay. and it, but it's 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 interesting. I mean. I, I, I don't think folks who work for me are going to say, oh, my God, he's a tyrannical ass. Yeah. You know, I, I think most folks would say. Is that, I, is that your epithet? <laughs> yeah. No, 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 it's going to be no, my no. tombstone. Yeah, right. No, I think they're going to say, I, I love working with him. I learned from him. It, it was a great tour. But I will tell you, I heard one of my subordinate commanders talking to his folks saying about me. He's got he's got great ideas and we need to get moving. He's also very impatient. <laughs> and so so the sharp edge of it is. Okay, we've agreed on what that vision is. Come back to me. The next the next discussion with us ought to be either I'm on it and it will be done by Friday or by June or whenever it may be, or I need your help somewhere. But I don't need the daily updates with status. I mean, I trust you. I mean, the enabling piece is you got the tools you need, right? Do you need additional support, top cover, up echelon communication? You know, where do you need me to roll in on your behalf? If not. Then why isn't why isn't it done? There you go. And and driving to closure is another thing that is a personal pet peeve for me. I say you know I just don't want to talk about things. I want to get them done and move on to the next. So thing. closure to active like to action. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then close the loop again. Is that part of? I mean, I, I like the OODA loop exactly. idea. Is, yeah. And so, but that's a little bit different. And let's describe OODA. Yeah. OODA loop yeah. For you. Uh, observe, loop. orient, decide, act. Yeah. And yeah. It, and is that something you use? Uh, we all do. Is, is that closing the is that closing the loop? Yeah. I, I just mean if we say this is um a policy document that needs to be signed by twenty people and we're targeting June, you know, I, I'm saying in May, how are we looking? Right. And don't come to me on the last day and say I was off by ninety days and it's actually gonna be in the fall, you know. How do you keep all of that organized? I I have a phenomenal staff. This is where I yeah. me trying to keep everything intact was is like it's a disaster, and you can hear laughter in the background. Yes, of yes. my team. Yeah, well, it's a bit of a disaster. I, I have to. I have to admit, we're very fortunate in the military, and this is something that I I do not see similarly in the civilian world. But but I've got a lot of folks who who are my enablers, yeah. and and some yeah. of them between a chief of staff and an executive assistant and an aide and a flag writer, they're there keeping the tickler list of the things that we talk about. And when we do uh, a meeting with what I call my division directors, essentially department heads, and, and we go through, we do a, a, you know, a sit down meeting. And as we're talking, I'm saying, that's great. Let, how long is that going to take? Okay. You say it's a month. All right. I'm making a tickler to say, check in, you know, at month or at day 25. How are you looking on that month deadline that you committed to? Great. So, I see. and, and again, some of these things that we're talking about when I deal in strategy and policy. So sometimes it's, in three years, we want to see this movement, you know, which is different than saying, update me every week on that. I mean, I, I don't have the appetite or interest, frankly, unless something is off plan. Do you have a cadence to your meetings? Like every day Absolutely. there's a thing and every week there's a thing. Do you have some sort of cadence? With my own staff, right. I have standing meeting once a week. So we okay. do a Wednesday morning session with the division directors. And, and, and how long is that? Uh, it's usually an hour. Okay. Um, and then the the offer is my door is open, and and you, 
they shouldn't feel like they need to wait until Wednesday to talk to me. I mean, I'm kind of talking to them all day, every day, and and we're pretty fluent with technology. So um, whether that's on chat or some other mechanism, I said preference is not to deal in email. That that is really not my uh, preferred communication mechanism, because I feel like for decades we as Americans got sloppy and lazy about saying, well, I sent an email, my work is done. So um, so two things about email. I say, not my preferred mechanism. You can come by and poke your head into my office anytime, you know, face to face, I'll take, that's a trump card. Or call me on the phone, no one ever does, but I, I offer that. Mm -hmm. But I said, or I would prefer IM over email. Mm. And we've gotten pretty good now. This is relatively new within the Navy, but uh, the Navy Reserve's leading the way here. We've been very, um, uh, encouraged by the behavioral change to use a collaboration suite. Mm -hmm. So another reason why I've said, I don't want any attachments in email. You know, we can post them, we can work them in parallel. You know, we've got tools similar to what you probably use as Google Docs. Mm -hmm. And I've just said, why get into version control issues with people emailing things? I said, let's just have one version of the truth and we can all access it together. And when I'm done, you know, we, we have a workflow that says like, okay, when everyone's put their inputs and then I get mine and we're done, a, we save hundreds of man hours in the way that we're working. So yeah, good. Yeah, yeah I, I've noticed the benefit. Of course. Well. Yeah. Yes. And then when you go up to the envision part of the model, yeah. Um, how do you help create a vision for people? Yeah. Like your your direct reports, your leaders, your heads sure. of departments. Well, I mean, there's there's a couple of layers to the answer. So as I mentioned, I deal in strategy and policy primarily. So so the president writes a document called the National Security Strategy. And the Secretary of Defense writes a national defense strategy. And the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs writes a national military strategy. And then the Chief of Naval Operations, who's my boss, writes the service component element of that. We call it the navigation plan. I read all of those. And then I get together with my staffs and say, here are the elements that I'm seeing where the reserves have either equity or potential capability. I think we should drive uh, activity towards delivering against those things knowing full well that it's nested with the demands of my boss and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the Secretary of Defense and the president. So, so that's kind of reserve force wide. I mean, it's, it's easy for me to read those documents and then circle the wagons to say, here's what it means to us. That's different though than when you say, how do you keep your people motivated or establish a vision? The vision that I want my staff to be aware of is I, I want to move fast. Velocity is important to me. You know, when I talk about any problem that's brought to us where the recommendation is I need more money, people, or time, I say we got to think harder about it. Once again, what's the problem statement? And and just a couple of tips and tricks that I, I look at when we're talking about problems in particular. One is where are we now? Can, can we baseline our performance against what the standard is? You know, are we supposed to be at 85%? And if so, where are we? Okay, well, if we're 82%, I see we got a problem. Or, hey, maybe we're at 92%. 92%. Can we get to 100? You know, again, so we're meeting the standard. Who sets the standard? Well, the standards are usually in instructions or documents or things where, you know, maybe I set the standard. or okay. but, um, but it could be, you know, in the same way that, um, you know, your PSA should be a certain level. You know, there, there are just some things that we know we need to be able to do for certifications or training. Okay. So, so first question, where are we relative to the standard? Because a lot of times people come in and say, we need to change this. I need more people. I need more money. I want to do something. And I go, okay, well, first, let me get a sense of the scale of the problem. Where, where are we now? The answer is not always, thanks for asking. It's measured very carefully and we know exactly. A lot of times it's, well, of course, we know we need to do this. I go, okay, well, show me. And then the second thing is, so what's the recommendation that you're making and how much better will the outcome be based on this recommendation. If we, if we implement fully the change that you recommend, how much better will we be relative to our performance today? And then we say, okay, so you're telling me it's gonna be an 8% lift on where we are. What's the cost in money, people, and time to develop the change that you're describing? Ultimately, what I'm getting at is I want them to understand the quantitative rigor to assess whether, is it worth it for us to do this? You know, I mean, I, I get 100 problems every day and sometimes I say, you're right, this is not perfect. It's number 20 on my top 10 list, though. I, I just don't have the time to dig into it. If you can affect the change, then more power to you. But the things that I want to sink my teeth into are the things that are going to give us 100% X return, you know, the ROI, like a portfolio manager. I, I want to move on the most impactful things because I, the other thing I recognize is if it was easy, 
it wouldn't come to me. <laughs> you know, it would have been done already. So I just, I walk in the door every day saying, I welcome the fact that everything that is brought to me is going to be complicated and unsolvable. <laughs> and, and then we'll solve them. Do you, do the people that are bringing you recommendations, do they come, do they come to their conclusions by committee or do they come from small groups of people figuring it out, like two or three folks, or is it their discernment as an individual? Generally, I, well, the answer is all the above. Um, and it has to do with authorities in our world. I mean, if for some of the very complicated problems we've got, it's multi-constituent, multi-stakeholder issues. So in those cases, you really need a working group. And, and we, I, I don't want consensus to be an excuse to not move. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but at the same time, it, it would be disingenuous to say, well, I'm just going to solve this problem and then have five people screaming like, what the heck? What did you just do? You know, I, I don't agree with it. So if it's something that is within the ownership of the individual, then I would expect the individual to solve it. If it's more complicated, then we'll bring in the appropriate folks. Okay. And so the consensus can be a problem. It can slow things down. That's why I'm asking Definitely. about velocity. Definitely. Yeah. And at the same time, discernment alone can miss some of the other signals sure. that are really important. Sure. Okay. So, so when, when you're, when you are trying to make the decisions of things that are complicated and hard, what capabilities do you want of your people? to be able to um, present in the right way, which is clear and brief. Yeah. It's down to the root cause with action steps that um, they believe will help solve this yeah. or get it closer. Okay. And I love the reference point about where we are relative to the standard. I want to come back to that in a minute. But what capabilities do you believe are the most important for your people? Um, and then I'm going to complicate it one more level and project out five years from now. Because the world business, and I'm imagining military operations and sport in general, are going to be different in five years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Generative AI, fill in of the course, blanks. Of okay. course. Yeah. So what capabilities are you most interested in right now? You know, I studied uh, operations research, operations analysis um, uh, as a master's degree, and I studied systems engineering undergrad. So, so I've always been kind of a quant guy. So, so the foundation for decision making for me is typically born in data. And- I, I certainly am a human, and so I have intuition. I, I try to mitigate the intuition with data, um, but I've also taken a lot of data. Oh, that's data. an interesting framing. Yeah. Mitigate. <laughs> well, mitigate because it's easy. Yeah. Because oftentimes, you know, I mean, we can all lie with statistics, right? I mean, I can. I can oh, yeah. Closed I, door I analysis. Can, exactly. And, I can take any data set and convince yeah. you that it should be white. Nope. Same data. No, it should be blue. Black. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so we want to be balanced. But but I like objective decision-making where possible. But what I've found too is sometimes you don't have the luxury of all of the data. And, and if it would be necessary for me to wait six more months to make a decision that was not a multi-billion dollar strategic decision, I say, I, I don't want to debate it in the boardroom. I'd rather try something now and then actually collect data on how it worked. You know, consider it a pilot test. Um, you know, this is kind of the lean startup approach. And, and I'm fortunate enough to have uh, people who are smart enough to understand what I mean and, and what we're trying to do when I say that. For instance, if it's something that we're trying to do with uh, a training mechanism to get a boat crew certified, you know, okay, it was supposed to take 36 months. I go, hmm, would it be possible to do it in 18 months? You know, what would be required to make it happen in 18 months? Well, there's certainly an assumption about availability and people and funding and what does that look like? I get all that. Okay, that's that's fact. How do we assess the risk? If we implemented that, would people quit? Would it be too hard? You know, is the operational tempo too rigorous? Um, but but my hope would be that we're not saying, well, someone told me two years ago that we tried it and it didn't work, so we're never going to do it again. So anyway, that, that's kind of the here and now piece. As it relates to what's going to happen over the next five years, there is no question that AI is going to transform the way that we access and act on information. We need to be really careful, all of us, the world needs to be really careful about um, the veracity of the information. I mean, hmm. you, you know that bots that are scraping the internet are, are scraping bad news and fake news as well as good news. So uh, so you have to be careful about kind of the sources. But but in terms of just pure mechanics, I mean, this is obviously on the order of the Industrial Resolu Revolution where, you know, we're going to free up a lot of time for people. And for every copywriter or art director who's saying, uh, this is travesty, I'm going to be out of a job, my first thought is, 
the art directors who learn how to use AI to, to hone their craft are the ones that are going to be in demand. So, so why not leverage it? I mean, this is, you know, this is like the invention of the wheel and saying those who can harness it are going to be the standouts. And that, that will have applications in business and military and elsewhere. I mean, there's no question we'll see. Okay, changes. so it would be fair to say uh, understanding how to interpret data, understanding how to uh, um, be blend intuition with objective data for discernment. Yeah. That would yeah. be a skill. There's something about risk taking and acceptance of mistakes yes. to be able to move with velocity and speed in yes. a pilot test. Yeah. And there's something about um, being stimulated by what's coming. So there's some sort of entrepreneurial mindset there. Like I want to get ahead of it. I like it. I like what I'm seeing. I'm going to yeah. invest my time and energy, even if it's like not specced in my job. Yes. Right. So there's, is that, does You're, that sound about right? It absolutely does. And mm -hmm. in fact, when I've described um, the approach that I've taken to affect this transformation, I mean, my tasking was to modernize the reserve force, to transition us from the global war on terror from over two decades, to prepare for what we refer to now as great power competition. Great power competition. Great power. So, so, so we're this past is not the kind, point. This is not state driven. Well, great powers are states. Okay. So peer and near peer states. Yeah. Transitioning from Al Qaeda, ISIS, violent extremism, that's global war on terror. Now we're saying Russia and China to some degree are on North Peer Korea. or near peer? Both. Yeah. I, I would say, yeah. Let's say near peer. Yeah. yeah One near peer. Um, so <laughs> they're not listening, by but, the way. But that, but, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You've got an international audience. This, um, is, this is fair. They're, yeah, uh, right. So, so as we, we look at the driver, you know, I have said there's a sense of urgency here. You know, oh, the it, race is on. Yeah. In, in yeah. many ways, I see similarities to the United States in 1939 to where we are right now. And I'm not chicken little and I'm not trying to scare people. But, but I'm saying that the readiness of the reserve force is something that I need to solve today. Because if we need to break glass because of emergency in, say, 2027, I don't want then to start saying, how are we going to mobilize 50,000 people? Gee, we didn't think of this. You know? right. And are they ready to go? And do they know where? Do they know what building they're going to go to? Does their ID card work? Do they have access to the desk? I mean, those are things that I want to work on today. That's wild. Like we're seeing some of the, the, um, the choke points from poor logistics in right. the operations that are taking place with absolutely. Russia and, and Ukraine right now. Like, yeah, absolutely. I didn't know this. This is obviously you know, table stakes for you, but like logistics make and break. I mean, Napoleon. Yeah, so right. The, uh, yeah. Army fights on its stomach. You yeah. Know? Right. Yeah. And, and I mean, we and every other country are watching uh, Russia's performance and, and giving them pretty low marks, but, but we're also preparing for, and we have, we've done this for decades. I mean, we continue to pour effort into how do we maneuver? Like the United States, we're a forward deployed force, you know, and, and having a forward deployed force is expensive. I mean, Navy, I always say, we are America's away team. You know? Oh, that's interesting. Way yeah, I mean, we've yeah. got we've got ships in Yakuska, Japan, and Sasebo, Japan, and Bahrain, and Rota, mm -hmm. Spain, and not only in Hawaii and in the continental United States in our fleet concentration areas, but you know, we are in Singapore, and you know, we're everywhere that we know we would need to be to support our allies and partners and our national interests, because the tyranny of distance has a time effect that we can't wait a week to get you know, from Hawaii to Japan, we need to be there. And, and when we talked earlier about what's going on in the South China Sea, you know, it's a long way from San Diego or Hawaii, but it's closer to Korea and to Japan. And so in some respects, um, it surprises me that we're considering w that war would be anything other than cyber or in space. It surprises me that we're yeah. moving, we're watching you know, war happen on people's stomachs, like or whatever that phrasing that you mentioned. Like, oh, yeah. It, yeah. Napoleon. Yeah. Napoleon's, yeah. yeah. It surprises me that it's, it hasn't, I don't know. I, 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 th I always thought like when I was a kid that the wars that would be happening later would be like information-based, cyber-based, something like yeah. that you would yeah. watch on Star Trek or S Star Wars or sure. something. Not that we might see that, but it would trend toward that. I is it trending that direction? Or do you think that it's more likely that we'll be in, a war with bullets and, you know, ships and, you know, I, I think, I think it will be bullets and ships, but, do, but yeah. it will certainly be supported by the capability that's resident in space and in cyber. So I think the nation that controls cyberspace has a distinct advantage 
and and AI factors into that. But um, but having command of how the electrons are flowing um, really mm. has a tremendous impact on everything from finding, fixing, tracking, targeting. I mean, all of those things now we do with computers. So. Um, what are some of the most yeah. interesting weapons that you've been exposed to or like <laughs> there's a lot of different weapons out there? There are. I probably don't want to go into it on this podcast. I mean, there's. You got me even more interested. I mean, I mean, we've got things that go many times the speed of sound. Have you heard of hypersonic weapons? I mean, yes. You know, they're, they are mind bogglingly fast. And so. And what, and what do they do? They'll. So they're it, missiles. That's a missile. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. a missile. But it but it goes so fast. Like keep in mind, our missile defense systems are pretty impressive in that even to defend against intercontinental ballistic missiles, what we do to defend is we shoot a missile at the incoming missile. So like the hatch has to open. Oh, the things yeah, yeah, got to yeah, yeah. get like yeah. be exact, precise. Of course, and but then, but then I say to put it into perspective, that's like you shooting a twenty-two caliber rifle at me. And me saying I'm going to shoot another, another bullet at it, you know. So, so the technology What's easier that or golf. Um, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> People brag about golf being so hard. I mean, come on. <laughs> You're right. Okay. Exactly. Jeez. Jeez. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do you have a preference for operations in in water or air or like where do you naturally lean? Like just personally. Sure. Okay. Well, I'm a surface warfare officer, so okay. so I serve on ships. Yeah, and and small boats, and so being on the water is uh, is kind of my trade. That said, uh, you know I own 150 airplanes as the chief of the Navy Reserve, so so we do all of the Navy's adversary missions. So we replicate, we do threat replication for deploying strike group air wings, so that we replicate what our adversaries how they might look. So you've heard of like Top Gun, right? So so the folks that play the bad guys are our reserve squadrons. So the good news about that and the reason oh, I bring so it up is- Oh, so they get in the MiGs or whatever and yeah, that type- Yeah, exactly. So I've got F-16s, we've got F-18s, we've got F-5s. What's, what's, what's the one that we're most like enamored by? Our ships. Uh, our ships? Well, we just launched what we call a Flight 3 Guided Missile Destroyer. Um, I mean, just just took ownership of it this week. So that is a, that's a game-changing capability. That's the equivalent of a new cruiser. Um, so it's a destroyer hull, but it's got, uh, and the difference between a cruiser and a destroyer historically has been size. Cruiser is a little bigger than a destroyer. So this is a little bit bigger on the existing frame of the guided missile destroyer, but, uh, but it's probably the most capable warship in the world. I mean, it's right now, now that, granted, that's a cool statement. I mean, that's different than an aircraft carrier, you know, so this, a, yep. a destroyer is about 10,000 tons and aircraft carrier is a hundred thousand tons and an aircraft carrier carries an air wing. And a destroyer carries missiles and guns, so so they have different functions. Got it. Yep. Complementary, but uh, but yep. different. So um, anyway, when you say like, what's the coolest one? You know, my submarine brothers and sisters would say, well, don't forget about the submarines; they're pretty cool too. Um, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> so, <laughs> those are pretty you know, good, right? They're yeah, pretty exactly. quiet down there. You know, we fly. Yeah. Uh, you know, my friend, <clears throat> call him the air boss, but the commander of the Naval Air Forces. Um, so we've got. F-35s, they're pretty spectacular. You know, we've got lots of F-18s, like you saw in Top Gun 2. Um, so- Was there an uptick in enlistment or enrollment? In recruiting? Yeah. Like uh, you know, it, it was rumored. So there was anecdotal feedback there. And there was, uh, similarly with Top Gun 1, the first one. And uh, and I think the facts don't bear it out. But it is a great talking point. I'd love to say there was, but but I don't think it's yeah, true. Sure. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in fact, I mean- How'd they do? Um, How'd, who, as, a, as a movie, like how'd they do? Oh, they did great. They yeah. did. In fact, you know, so the one of the advisors for the flight sequences was a Navy Reserve Captain Aviator. So uh, Ferg, call sign Ferg. Nice job, Ferg. Nice job. Um, anyway, mm -hmm. so, and lots of photos with him, with Tom Cruise. You know, they say like shooting their watch. As they say, like doing oh, that, um, what does that mean? Like, you know, because you're shooting, oh, shooting, shooting, the, shooting, I shooting your watch yeah. as you're simulating what you're going to do with your hands. But oh, uh, that's fine. anyway, yeah. but, uh, but I, I thought they did great. Now, granted. Uh, my expectations for movies are probably different than some of my New York based it's, friends. It's, it's hard, who are it's in hard the industry. for you to watch that and oh, not yeah. pick out all the. Like, I mean, yeah, what I'm BS saying, I'm sitting there with my wife elbowing, going, you know, uh, okay, well, John Hamm plays my friend in real life. Oh, that's yeah. right. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, right. And, and I'm saying, and by the way, you know, he would never say that. And she's going, okay, okay. you and like five Can other I just people watch in the world. Tom Cruise. Exactly. Like, yes. Yeah, okay, yes. good. Okay, so from weapons to limitations. So what are some of the limits or limitations that you see that people bump into? 
And these are barriers, and I'm more interested in the internal barriers mm-hmm. that people run up against that um, get in the way of them living their best life. Yeah, you know, being able to really fill in or f- uh, pour into to the mission uh, that the, that that they're working on. So, what are some of those limitations? The older I've gotten, the more I've seen the importance for the balance between mental, physical, and spiritual wellness. No, no question. And what I used to be able to get away with as a younger man was to eat terribly, exercise vigorously, and pull all nighters, and you know celebrate with a cup of coffee in the morning for breakfast kind of thing. And, you know, my famous line was, I can sleep when I'm dead. And what I'm finding now, though, is I am not as cognitively sound if I don't get the right amount of sleep. I don't have the energy to perform like I know I need to if I don't exercise. And so as a result, you know, what, I, what I'm doing now is incorporating a far more rigorous and healthy approach to diet to exercise. I mean, I, I look forward to exercising to the point where we were talking on the break. You know, I get up pretty early. I get up at 3.30 to meet a friend at 4 so we can exercise together. We'll lift and do some cardio between 4 and 5.30, which then allows me to get a little bit of breakfast and then get myself to the office by about 7.30. And so w- when you say, what are the limitations? I, I'd say as I've aged, I've seen some differences there. Some of it is just how much energy do you have You know, the energy management is critical. And then cognitive function is impacted by everything else I just described. And then the spiritual piece, you know, everybody can interpret spirituality differently, but but having some time to either meditate or breathe or think or, you know, atone um, is important because anything that I find allows your brain to kind of shift gears a little bit from rigorous uh, analytical behavior to thoughtful, quiet thinking, you know, I think that's a great unlock. And so I, I don't know that I can apply that to 60,000 people necessarily, but, but I've sure seen it myself as I've aged over time. I love that. So if I, just to kind of play it back, the, the most significant limiter that you've experienced in your life is available energy, yeah, internal energy, like that volition, that that um, kind of raw power to solve things, to do things, right. that, that if you don't take care of that, that there's, a, um, there's just a limitation. Absolutely. Way, and yeah. Another example, uh, peripherally related but still germane, was you know, I used to do a lot of running. And, and over the span of two years, I broke each of my ankles in almost the same place. What kind of running? I, I know. Yeah. Like, I wish there was a good story. I mean, right? I, I was running along a river. And, and the tile shifted, oh and which God. rolled my ankle. So uh, in one of my ankles, I've got a synthetic ligament now. But um, but after a couple of surgeries, and you know, I remember saying to the doctor as I was coming out of surgery, how long before I can run again? And he said, oh, you know, you should take your time on this, probably take about eight weeks. And at eight weeks, I mean, I said, a day one of week eight, I will be running. And, um, and it was excruciating. And I said, I'm not ready yet. But as a result, what I found was, I mean, it took me about six months before I could really run. And, and I went from 30 miles a week to, you know, five or something, which was not satisfying. And, and at that point, I was doing a lot of cardio and not much else. So, so since then, I've learned, hey, at my age, I should be doing more strength and weight training too. So, so anyway, but it was really inci- or enlightening to me that I recognized without being able to run, I don't feel the same. I'm, I'm not as energetic. I'm not as excited. I'm not as, it it impacted my optimism. You know, I felt like damaged goods almost. Yeah. And I'm not going to let this slip. Okay. With all the reverence I have for you. (laughs) A 3.30 a.m. wake up. That's early. Yeah. Okay. And so that might fit your chronotype and your, the way that you're genetically wired for it to be an early riser. Tell me the amount of sleep you get. (laughs) (laughs) Well, so when I started tracking it, yeah, it, it was abysmally bad. I mean, it was like between four. And How half were you and tracking? Five. Self-report um, or you? Were well, you using at the first I was uh, I had like a Fitbit and I mm-hmm. was uh, tracking that way. So now I, I don't wear a Fitbit. I just look at my clock and say, "All right, I know this is going to be five hours." So I'm not looking at the quality of sleep necessarily. Okay. Although I, I had done that for a number of years, I, I just can't wear that now because of our job. We can't have uh, kind of Bluetooth things on us. So anyway, um, but I'm I'm looking at at least the span of time. Wait, I'm wait, trying wait, to get wait, to wait, seven. You can't have Bluetooth because is that a cyber threat? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
I got to know about this. Like, so is it like, could I be hacked? Oh, if, if there's anything that you know of that's digital, easily hacked, it can be hacked. Yeah. Easily hacked. Yeah. So if I'm wearing a ring that has like, I mean, I don't know what get someone in, would do. So that, that would get into the phone. Right. I mean, yeah. I'm not that interested, <clears> but they could get into the phone and get into whatever yeah, the, I mean, the phone this, holds. I, I'm, that, I'm not a hacker, but I would say like for my, for my kids, um, Hey, if you've got TikTok on your phone, your phone is on my network. And then what is available as things become vectors to other things. So anyway. That, okay. So go back to the sleep for you. Right. Right. So I want to get to seven, which is my goal. I'm usually getting about six or five and a half, but, but I know that's bad. So before you chastise me, <laughs> yeah. I, I will say, I know this. In, before shame in, is, a, is a, now a new because weapon I've made in our arsenal. huge strides with nutrition mm. and exercise. So the sleep is the one where I'm saying I've identified it as the laggard in this three-legged stool that I want to get better on. Are you using physical training for physical health and or mental health? And or which one would you, you're saying yes to both? Yes, right? absolutely. And which one would you say is more interesting to you? The, the mental, psychological benefits or the physical? Mental first. But I have to admit, I mean, when I couldn't run, I gained weight. And I thought to myself, I, I don't like being heavy or out of, That's out right. of shape. Yeah. But- I love my workouts in the morning because that's when I can have some uninterrupted time. And that's just uh, cool. Like I, I don't cognitive. I, I don't uh, want to do yeah. what um, Descartes did and try to pull the mind and body apart. Right. Like I'm not yeah. trying to do that, but I, I'm just trying to get a sense of like, is it more for the mental or and or physical? And it, uh, of course it's both. Okay. It, both. But I would tell you the physical uh, I value, but the mental I, I couldn't live without. And when it comes to nutrition, um, it sounds like you're learned in all of these forms of well-being and taking care of yourself for longevity, for high performance, for lifespan, for high performance. Are you um, are you doing intermittent fasting? Are you not interested? You're not interested. I, I, in that. I dabbled in it. And it didn't. Okay. It didn't do anything for me. And and then okay, so you've upgraded on nutrition. You've upgraded mm -hmm. on movement, and you have not quite upgraded to the level to the standard. Let's say. Right. Self-imposed standard of would we call it eight hours? No, I, I'd love to. I, that's what that's at some what I'm, point. I'm like, I'm really good at like seven four seven point four five. It's okay. kind of where I'm trending right now, where I'm getting that right ratio between deep and REM. Yeah. And my game is not necessarily carving out. I am disciplined and competing my ass off to to get somewhere between eight and seven hours every night. Like, I'm competing my ass off. Yeah. And my family is to to do that. So it's a full-time job to try to figure this thing out. But I know if I don't do that and I don't play some of the right notes in the day, my deep sleep is like Suffers. so suspect. Yeah. And so I've got to play the right notes to get that right symphony at the at at night, but so so your is your first priority to try to go from 6 to 6 and a half? Yes. In fact, I, I was even looking forward to this conversation so I could ask you. Yeah, let's go. Because if I had to give up something, is it more valuable to sleep the extra two hours or to get the workout in? Yeah, I don't know how to pull them apart yeah. either. I, I think that um, if we played, if we did like a, uh, we're on a strike mission and we've got a, you know, a five-day strike mission and it's on. I can go without sleep. Right, right. Short um, duration, yeah. Right, in a short duration. I'm okay, but I'm compromised. I am compromised towards the end of that. Definitely. But I need to come in fit, mm -hmm. right? So I've got yeah. it. My, my system has to be tuned well for me to drain it in that type of like compromised sleep state for, for a five-week or five-day period. Right. And when we go away, now let's extend it out to a handful of weeks. And then I'll extend it out for like a lifetime, Okay. So if we're going to do, when we do a high performance camp at the Olympics or pro camp and like it's on for three weeks and we're in a different part of the world and we're eating food that's not normally our right. food and maybe we're having to ship some of it in or we've got a chef on board that's helping us dial in our nutrition or we're piecemealing it if we're on a budget, uh, piecemealing it to our best abilities. So you've got sleep, um, physical movement, you've got uh, nutrition, and then you've got psychological fitness, if you will. Okay, so let's think about those four. We'll put spiritual as an asterisk right now. Mm. It's actually more of a, um, it's an underpinning of the whole thing, is spiritual. Right. Okay, but l let's just talk about those four dials for a minute, is that I think we need to get two out of four right just to be included. Right. 
three out of four right to be in striking distance of high performance, four out of four right to be playful with your craft. Awesome. Okay, so two is a baseline, three is what we're looking for, and and you can play with it. Like, it doesn't necessarily yeah. matter, okay? And if we get four out of four, we're winning, like for sure. All that being said, if you were to press me now and say, which one is most significant for you? I go, okay, I gotta do the complicated thing that uh, they're all connected. And then I say, sleep. Sleep is really? ground zero. Really? Yep. And then I say, listen, if, if I'm sleeping right and I'm not fueling it properly, why, why would I do the, the movement on top right. of it? Because movement is a drain. So I'm sleeping right to fill up my bucket. And then fitness is like, I'm draining the bucket. And if I'm not feeding it properly, like now I'm in a compromised state. Yeah. Okay. Now, all that being said is that when you get your thinking dialed in, and I don't mean like intelligence, I mean the ability to be optimistic in a face of challenge, the ability to be calm and not burn through resources unnecessarily, mm -hmm. the ability to be grounded and be where your feet are in any environment, that is so less expensive when you operate from that type of position inside of yourself that now we're winning at another level because I, I don't maybe need as much sleep. Okay, so the sleep studies keep coming back seven to eight hours of sleep on average for the majority of people. And I think that that would also assume that the majority of people are not getting psychological skills training. So they're uh. expensive to operate because they're anxious, they're nervous, they're frustrated, they're fatigued. They're, that's an expensive operating system. I think we could change that model. And I know that I'm dealing with a millions of years old operating system, our brain, but I do think we could upgrade it in a way if the data pool in, let's call it 10 years or five years from now, of those people had a real investment in psychological skills, a small investment in nutrition, I don't think we need eight hours of sleep on average. I think sure. we can get, and I know I, I'm being, um, I can hear I can hear all of my research friends right now going, are you kidding me right now? You're not gonna change the brain in that kind of short amount of time. But the the, the subject pool yeah. was deft in like it was it was wanting when it comes to psychological skills operations, which is an efficient way to go through the world. Yeah. No, thank you for that. And that's uh, that is perfect context. Uh, I've wrestled with this one often, saying, okay, I, I'm struggling to find the time because I don't want to go to bed at eight o'clock at night. You know, generally, by the time I get home from work, that gives me enough time to have dinner and then work a little more before I go to bed. So this is a passion problem for you? Like you love what you're doing? Or is this like you can't quite turn it down? Well, I don't see you as being disorganized. I no, don't see no, you no, as I'm being pretty, undisciplined. I'm pretty organized. Yeah, um, right. pretty disciplined, I think. So it, it's interesting that in my case, I, I'm referred to as a geographic bachelor. Have you ever heard this term? Before? No. Okay. So, so my family's in New York City. Okay. But- I'm down in DC working at the Pentagon. So, so I try on weekends when I'm not traveling for work, I'll go home and that's when I get to spend time with my wife and kids. You know, we FaceTime every night, but as a result of being down in DC by myself, it just fuels my being a total workaholic. Oh my God, I so, I've never heard this. I completely relate to this. Oh yeah, yeah. Like so, when I'm away, what else am I doing? Right on. And, it, and yeah. so like, I kind of like it. I, I am amazingly effective. I mean, I, I said to, at yeah. one point to my staff, I was relatively new in the job and I'll always take work home. I mean, the other thing that I recognize is if I come in really early, they'll all come in earlier. And if I stay really late, they'll all stay. So even when I said, hey guys, I'm just gonna stay here and do some reading, you all go home. No one wants to leave. They won't. Boss is here. So, so I try to leave at a decent hour between like five and six, I would say. And then and, you and send it, emails at 11 p.m. But I always say, <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow, please make sure you address this. I, I'm not trying to get people to work around the clock. Okay. And I will tell them, just because I'm a workaholic <laughs> doesn't mean that I'm encouraging that behavior in you. Um, Do you want this, this pattern for if your child is passionate about something, would you want this behavior, this pattern of behavior? If it made them happy, absolutely. Are, are you happy? I am. You are happy. I, are you I living am the good excited. life? When I wake up every day, I, I couldn't be more thrilled. Is I, that the good life for you? It is. I mean, so I, I can't believe I'm excited. getting a paycheck to do this. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, honestly, it's, really? uh, I mean, I am so humbled and honored to do this job. I mean, it, it really is amazing to me. And I think I want to earn it. 
Are you I saying that because day. you're supposed to, or you really feel it? I feel it actually, but I just want to make sure I'm not oh like, God, you're not no. selling me something here. No, no, no. no. I mean, yeah. Honestly, in fact, I love what I do. My wife is the hero in this story though, because when I was nominated to take this job, I said, honey, you're not going to believe this. I just got a call from the chief of naval operations and you're never going to guess what he said. He asked me if I wanted to take this job and she goes, I think you're the only person who didn't know this call was coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so good. No, but anyway, yeah, yeah, and yeah. I, I said, well, we should talk about this because it's a four-year job and it means that we're moving to D.C. And she says, um, well, the kids are pretty happy in their school here and <laughs> my job is in Manhattan. Um, so, you know, you can do this. Let me know what your hotel room uh, yeah, or your, exactly. your apartment I, mean, I, I have like, uh, yeah. wonderful quarters oh, that, are, yeah. that, are, uh, that are part of the job. But anyway, I always say, she let me do this because this puts tremendous burden on her. I used to walk the kids to school. I would take them to sports. I would participate in all the PTA meetings, none of which I do now. Can, you, can we talk about that partnership for a minute? Absolutely. Are you okay to talk yeah, about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, family is like, I didn't, I didn't have this awareness maybe even like seven years ago. Now, and and I'll tell you why I'm marking that note or that year. But what people would ask me my whole career, what, what are the com most common traits of the best in the world? And, and, you know, scientifically, I would say we can't, we don't know, right? And I would, now, like when I, I feel like maybe I'm an old person at the table, but I push my, ta my chair back and I can see the playing field easier partnerships are a huge part of it and that the support that they have from that environment and sometimes those environments are chaotic and sometimes they're loving and kind and they come in all different flavors but there's something about that partnership at home outside of the operating environment that is foundational absolutely and yeah. Yeah. so like what what is the, every every relationship i've ever encountered has different flares and tones to it like what is yours like with your wife well so we have our we celebrate our 30th anniversary in three weeks. So, um, so we've been doing this for a while. Um, we have three kids. Very cool. Oldest is 13. We have twins that are 11. So if you do that math, we obviously waited for a long time. Uh, same, before we we have kids. the same path. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we have the same path. I mean, we did 35 fact, years. So my wife's yeah. name is Kim. Kim has said to our friends, the most irresponsible thing we've ever done is have twins at 44. Um, so, <laughs> it, But it keeps us young. Uh, there's no question. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so when you say, what does it look like? I mean, she is my best friend. You know, she is clearly someone who is my consigliere and confidant. You know, I don't go to her and say, you know, how do you think I should respond to what Russia just did? But but I do certainly talk <laughs> right, about, right. you know, yeah. we live and breathe in online calendars. And, you know, I mean, I'm traveling 20 days a month and I'm trying to get to meet up with her and the kids wherever they may be, whether it's for soccer tournaments or basketball tournaments often. So, you know, we're, we're both busy, but, um, but I look forward to our, you know, 10 minute FaceTime every day that, that is at both a source of rejuvenation and, um, and encouragement. But, you know, I keep coming back to, if she said this is too hard, I would stop doing this immediately. How do you support her? Like, what are the ways, because I don't know what her profession is, and she yeah, might she works be world's in, best in, in yeah, whatever she's doing. Wealth or, management. Yeah. Is she yeah. okay? She is in wealth management. She is, which world, is a, world's best. Yeah, there uh, you go. Yeah. Uh, so, like, so how do you support her in that? In that I, I mean, right now I'm an absentee husband and father. So failing. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> failing. look, and there's there's guilt there. I there mean, if, yeah, I I, um, I see it and I feel it. So. I know, so I'm in my own life. I would say the way that I support her is when I retire from this job, I will make it so worth her while. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I love definitely. hearing this definitely. because, you know, so just the other night we're at dinner with my a couple friends and they, they were, t were talking about our like next phases or whatever. Right. And my son is 14 heading into high school. So we've got four years until like he's, you know, he's got plans for college. And you know, so we got four years together as a unit. And, um, Somebody asked, like, so what's next? And I go, I flat out want to make sure that Lisa decides, my wife decides, like, the next phase. And I would bet that she wants to live in New York City, in Manhattan. Yeah, how about okay. it? Right? And, and that's, okay. where, that's where your wife is, right? And that, or where she's working. Yeah. And so I think yeah. in, in the future, that's where I'm operating from, which is going to be really hard for me. I love, okay. I want to live 
by an ocean on a mountain or um, a, a running river. And so, and she's like, I want the concrete. I want big city. I want that energy. So, so now's my by the, turn. By the time you move, yeah. uh, I will retire from this job and we're in Tribeca. And um, well, that's where she wants to go. Okay. okay. I, yeah. Keep me on the speed dial. Yeah, good. I, okay, good. I'll show, you where, I'll show you where I broke each of my ankles running around the Hudson <laughs> yeah. River. Oh my God. I know. <laughs> yeah, that's so, so good. All yeah. right, good. So, all right. So let's go, let's take a one extension. Um, or actually, let's finish this up. Like, yeah. what would you hope young people listening um, that are in their marriage right now, or maybe they're mm -hmm. not even young, that you would say, listen, I've learned about being a good partner. I hope that you will do A, B, and C to yeah. be a great partner. Yeah. Are there any specific things that you're doing to be a great I, partner? I mean, absolutely. One is choose your battles. I mean, Kim and I determined early on. It's funny coming from you. There, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it really is funny. There, but we said there are some th things that she's going to own and I trust her. And there are some things that I'm going to own and she's going to trust me. And the idea there is I don't need her telling me how to install the cable or get the network working. And I'm not going to give her critiques on the laundry, you know? And so she says, if it's mechanical or electrical or trash, it's you. If it's uh, nesting, home design, decor, or food, it's her. So, you know, dividing and conquering is something that, that we agreed to. If she were telling you the story, she would say that it was born from an occasion when she was working very hard and I was in grad school. And she would come home after a hard day's work, and I would have been back from an early morning workout with a couple of SEAL buddies, a couple hours of class, 18 holes of golf, four people at our house drinking a bunch of beer. And she'd come in saying, I'm exhausted. And we go, okay, well, what's for dinner? You know, and she's like, all right. Yeah. You're, you're we we got to have you're, a talk here. Yeah. That's a battle. Yes. Okay, yes. Right. So anyway, back to yeah. uh, talking to young couples. I would say, first, figure out what you both love kind of deconflict them. You know, each of you should own something. And maybe there are things you like doing together. If you like to cook together at the end of the day, that's great. It could be romantic, but, but still figure out what you want to be responsible for so that you can lighten the load for the other person. Check in, you know, men are from Mars and women are from Venus. You know, I, I've learned not to leap to solutions if and when I'm hearing of something that is uh, either annoying or conflicting her. So, you know, under, being a good listener is great for men. Um, and, and then at the end of the day, I would say, we always viewed it as we're a team. Even before we got married, you know, I, I remember saying to her, I feel so much better about myself when I'm with you. Okay. Uh, team. I, 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 you build teams, right? Right. And you're building teams in, um, with constraints and with resources, like uniquely, everybody has constraints and resources. And I, 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 I spend a lot of time thinking about teams as well. And I'm just in this place like, you know how like early early on in some ideation or, or um, maybe in your career, you're like, I get it. And then you get into that messy middle, you're like, I don't get it. And then it's supposed to get simple again. And I feel like, I don't know where exactly I am, but I'm tired of talking about teams right now. And, <laughs> um, and because I'm much more interested in talking about team mating being a teammate and Perfect. like I'm far more interested in that than this concept of what a great team is. Like I want to know yeah. about yeah. how can people be great teammates? How can I be a great teammate and how can they be great teammates? And now we have can a team. I, it's like, can I throw some raw meat your way? Cause yeah. I, this is the softball down the middle for you. So my 13 year old is, uh, is very athletic and she starts high school also. So she'll be in ninth grade next year but um, has always excelled in soccer and basketball. And one of her coaches said, if she wants to be a D1 player, she'll be a D1 player. The conversations I've had with her though, and, and I mean, this is right up your alley. I'm eager to hear this feedback was, I, I've said, uh, her name is Morgan. I hope I'm not embarrassing her here, but- What's but up, I, Morgan? Uh, yeah, I know. but I've said, Morgan, you're a gifted athlete. The difference between great athletes and others is there are many gifted athletes. But gifted athletes who train hard and commit to the sport are the ones that you hear about. And, and the reason I say that is because I question sometimes her commitment. She's always gotten away with it. She's always been the best one on the team. And yet I'm saying you're getting to the age now where you're going to get left in the dust with people who are going to work harder than you. And so one other comment, again, and this is all uh, where I'm dying to hear your feedback, was you're also at the point where your individual contribution is less valuable than your ability to make the team better. So if you had 38 points, that's great, but you lost. 
I'd rather you score 20 and win. So trying to teach her again how to be a leader on the course or on the court and off the court and to say your outcome driver, not not your metric of success as points or time minutes played. The outcome is did you win or not? And that's the team contribution. So anyway, back to you. Julie Foudy, three-time Olympic medalist uh, in women's soccer. She says on the world stage, everybody is working hard. Right. That's a prerequisite. But you're measured uh, on how well you make others better when you're part of the system versus right. not part of the system. Yeah. Matter of fact, the one the women's U.S. Women's Olympic volleyball team. I was part of the the team that went to Rio, and we took a member, Courtney Thompson, who on paper technically maybe wasn't wasn't going to make it. Okay, her technical skill on paper, she was not going to be selected to make one of the twelve uh, that we took. However, she made, and I'm going to I'm going to butcher the exact number. She made everybody else when she was around two to three percent better. Yeah, yeah. It's like points against replacement player, right? That's exactly yeah. it. Yeah. So, so I mean, it's a massive, like I'm so much more interested in how can I be a great teammate? I want to be part of a team. I want to help other people have a great team. But the substrate of that is being a teammate. Mm -hmm. And if you're anxious, mm -hmm. fatigued, frustrated, overwhelmed, you're going to try to take care of yourself. You can't give yeah. anything. What you're giving is that, as we mentioned earlier. So I'm so much more interested in like creating the psychological skills for people to be buoyant enough. They've got their life vest on so they can reach out and grab and help and support and challenge in the right way to meet that person in just the right way that they need it. So like what, what insights do you have about people being great teammates? Are there any practices that you help, you know, go through? I mean, it's, it's similar to your experiences and what you just described. I mean, I, I've always subscribed to the approach of, um, you know, I'm, I'm a Red Sox fan. So I always thought, look, the, the Yankees will buy all-stars in every position. Do you like being a Red Sox fan? <laughs> I do. You do? <laughs> you do? And Patriots. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And Celtics. Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah. Go see how um, yeah, anyway. right. no, Go I Dodgers. Know. Yeah. So my- Pete Carroll my, was a Patriots. Come yeah, on. My, um, he was. Um, my grandfather, like, I can see him. Uh, he, he served- in the military as well. And he had, um, he was a, a, just a Red Sox hats everywhere he oh, went. Yeah. So like, yeah. so we've got the kinship there. Well, it's funny. Okay. I, like our kids in, in our entryway, which I hope you see soon, we've got a photo of our kids just decked head to toe in socks gear. And so our friends walk in from Manhattan and go, what do you want your kids Red to get beaten up? You yeah, know, right, what are we doing? Um, no, that's good. Okay. But anyway, but back to the yeah. philosophy, you know, the, the idea was, hey, do you want the the 11 best players or do you want the best 11 players? And so, I mean, that's what you're getting at. And that's, that's what drives me too, is I always say, if I'm evaluating the productivity or the outcome, not, not output, I mean, I view output as activity metrics. I'm more about outcomes, like what difference does it make? And so I just evaluate this. I mean, there's not a framework for it, but, but I'm watching to see who, who's the all-star diva whose chemistry is terrible that degrades the performance of the team as opposed to the person, as you mentioned, I go, I feel like I can train anybody with the skills to be successful on a staff, but the chemistry check is the critical enabler. Like that's what I'm looking for. How do you hire for that? Or how I do mean, you select I'll, I'll tell for you, that? I mean, we just, I'm a staff member that I just finished interviews with and I hired the person based on the quality of the interview. And, and our interviews are probably a little different than some of your interviews, but I've hired a lot of folks in my civilian job too. But, you know, I always say, I call it the chemistry check. I'm looking for enthusiasm, optimism. Do they look you in the eye? Do they speak with clarity? Do they have a sense of purpose? Not, hey, check out my resume. I did everything you're asking. And of course I can do whatever right, it is. Right. Like I'm a winner. Yeah. Right. I mean, my, my, and the other thing that I do. Do they show up like that sometimes? Oh, like that type of oh, yeah. arrogant? But yeah. And the other thing that I will always do is in my front office staff, I'll have each of them weigh in on this because people come in and they're waiting. And then I'll say, hey, uh, did you talk to them and what'd they say? And, and if they're either, you know, too busy looking down at their phone or they're not engaging with the people, you know, that's a, that's a message. Uh, the ones who say, I'm really thrilled to be here. Hey, by the way, what should I know about the boss? Anything that he's going to ask me that I should know about? You know, I mean, that's a degree of interest that is uh, an indicator for me too. So lots of tools, none of which are unique, but, uh, but it's a whole person multiple there. So the insights that you've learned from military, both on leadership, building teams via teammating and that, that that how has that served you in your civilian life? Because you've yeah. built some 
companies. Absolutely. You're, you're, yeah. You've got an entrepreneurial background. Of course. Yeah. And so how do, how do some of those skills translate over and also speak to like the reservist life a little bit? Oh, yeah. Thanks for teeing that one up. So, so first, the military training was definitely applicable to leadership roles. I mean, I've been a C-suite uh, executive in many occasions, CEO. I own a company that I founded. Um, so, so the idea of establishing a vision, you know, creating the enabling mechanisms to allow folks to perform, setting the expectations for performance. I mean, those are all standard kind of military treat uh, um, approaches that are directly applicable in a civilian sector too. Doesn't matter if you're wearing a uniform or a suit. I would say going in the other direction has been more enlightening because most of my peers, particularly as a vice admiral, are not reserve officers. In fact, there's only one three-star reserve officer. That's me. So the rest are career naval officers. My peers have all been in the Navy for 34 to 38 years, and that's what they do. So I'm not throwing shade on them, but they've never had to hire 24-year-olds that are choosing between you and Amazon and Google. You know, they, they've not kept up with the pace of technology and some of the things that, that I walked in the door saying, why aren't we doing this? The rest of the world operates this way, and yet we're etching stuff on stone tablets and flying things with carrier pigeons. You know, it's 2023. We need to get with the program. And I wouldn't have been able to do that if I had been brought up using the tools that are available. So, so in some ways, I've been an effective change agent. Um, via tasking. I mean, I had this conversation with my boss, the chief of naval operations, saying, I'd like the opportunity to demonstrate this transformation. And you can view the Navy reserves as a black box. You know, this will be the pilot test. And if I'm confident that it's working, I'll enroll you in it, you can assess it. And then we can determine, is it worthy of rolling out at scale to the rest of the Navy? So, oh, that's cool. Yeah. And, oh, so and that's honestly, how you think about. Oh, absolutely. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. And 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 we are huh. on the the leading edge of technology implementation. I mean, we're doing things now with remote access and what we call uh, virtual desktop mechanisms and distributed people. Because back to your question about the reserve force, I've got people in every state and territory. We are the prototypical distributed force. So for me to allow my people to be productive without having to fly them to a fleet concentration area. You know, if you live in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, I don't want to have to fly you to San Diego to do work. I want to give you the tools or the access so you can access the networks and the files and the training and the online learning management systems and things so you can be productive where you are, which saves time and money in transit. You know, I, I'm not suggesting there's not value in face-to-face -face interaction. Right. But there are occasions where it is advantageous for us to leverage the technology so that we can keep people where they are and still be productive. If you were, if you were running a, a sixty thousand person org, yeah. not in the military, but in right. like an enterprise business, how would you approach the hybrid workforce? Yeah, exactly as you described, it would be you, a hybrid workforce. You would yeah. do hybrid. Yeah, I would say. Would look, you have days where you wanted everybody in, or you, like how would you do? You know how it hand, I, I would I would talk to my COO mm -hmm. and say, you're going to be tracking it. So I don't want to make a mandate that we can't enforce. So what do you recommend? And then let's talk about what we want to see. I, I maintain that my people are evaluated on their outcomes and productivity, not necessarily where they do that. Part of that was born from my time at Wasabi because I dealt with so many creative folks who said, I came up with this idea in the shower or it was 12 o'clock at night. You know, I said, so, so certainly there's benefit in being around the water cooler together. The, but good ideas are, there's no monopoly of them in the office, you know? So anyway, and the other thing that I would offer on that front too is I don't think that you can develop culture via Zoom or Teams or online. I haven't figured it That's out. That's hard. Yeah. I you know? yeah. yeah. As much as we are intentional about relationships, exactly. both at Finding Mastery and any, anywhere we go, we're, we are helping others and we are ourselves a relationship-based organization that is developmentally minded. And we think people want to be in those environments yeah. and we have high standards and um, we're as sloppy as it gets because we're trying to innovate. So our yeah. processes are not clean. They're changing all the time. And so that's one of our great tensions. Try it. Yeah. yeah. We're trying yeah. to figure things out. But that being said, it's like, you know, if I, if I could wave a wand, I would want everybody um, kind of like geographically right around my house. And we all like, we all live like within <laughs> Like a Three, commune. Five miles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know we're yeah. back to the seventies. <laughs> like it feels that way. Well, no, but like, so, but, like we're all kind of community minded. We're in the same yeah. place. We love that environment. We go to, we we walk to work in a way that feels really good, and then we've got this great culture inside where it's spacious and what da 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 da. Yeah, and, 
that's not how it's working now. No. And, and so, and I'm not naive. I mean, I understand some people, if, if you said we're doing this entirely remotely, some people will take advantage of it. I'm not one of them. Um, my approach my, in mine general, is not like they'll, I, I guess I, I actually do think sometimes about like, I don't expect people to, to grind the way I grind. I don't think it's necessarily healthy. And I, like, I don't want to impose that on others, but I do th- like, I, I want, I want to be around people that are really passionate about the thing right. together. And if that's the case, we have to say, we have to watch another clock, which is that we have to make sure that they're punching out quote unquote, right? not punching in. No, no, no. You know, exactly. So exactly. I do, I, you know, like th- that is a little bit of a concern from the hybrid, but like, I don't know how to be sophisticated enough to measure well, output. I mean, I just, I, I look at it from a cultural perspective as, okay, let's start on a basis of trust. I, yeah, that's I, the I right foundation. You, yeah. Right? The way I say wait, it wait, is- Wait, hold on. Do you, yeah. do you give trust or earn trust? I start from a basis of, I assume that everyone is trustworthy. Assume best intent. Exactly. Yeah, okay. positive intent. And, and then I say though, in fact, when everyone checks in to my staff, I give them a little sheet. It's basically, what to know about working with John? <laughs> Oh, you do? But yeah, yeah. Oh, that's and, cool. And, and one of the things I say is we all start from a basis of trust. If you lose it, it will be very hard to get back. So my, my point is I will give you the benefit of the doubt, but if you take advantage of that or you lose my trust, you probably need to go yeah, somewhere else. So you give trust. And then when trust is broken, yeah. it, it, the water table goes to negative or does it go to like so low that it's... It, I mean, it depends on the on the, on the nature of the uh, yeah, right. of the break, okay. but but the point being, we start from a foundation of we're all trustworthy, we're all working together, mm-hmm. we you know assume positive intent. Um, but but as it relates to the telework thing, what, the reason I bring that up is I say, look, I trust you all. There are going to be times when your child has a bloody nose at school, or needs to go to the doctor, or you need to meet the cable guy, or your car breaks down. Go take care of that. I, I'm not worried about you being productive and I'm not worried about you being gone. You know the work that you're responsible for and you're accountable for. And as long as you can do it, I don't care where you do it. It's like you treat them like adults. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Um, on the trust thing for one, one more bit, I think we all have this water table of trust and it's based on our genetic predisposition. It's based on how we're raised. It's based on the neighborhood we grew up in, the geographic location. And, um, I think we have this water table of trust that we come into relationships with. And we've got this idea, and this goes back all the way to Aristotle, like long time ago, there's three legs to trust, ability, benevolence, and authenticity. So if you can walk the walk and talk mm-hmm. the walk, like I should probably trust you. Like you can get, yeah. you can get kind of get it done. Are you in it for me as well as you are for you? The benevolence, are we in right. this together? Or are you trying to take all the chips off the table? Yeah. You know, is this just for your gain or is this, am I involved in your success as well? That's benevolence and authenticity. Are you going to show up consistently across conditions, bringing, being your very best? You can wobble on any of these, but if there's enough consistency across those three, like that's, I think trust has to be earned. So it's interesting that you you want to give it. I want to, I want to, I, I think I'm more afraid of being burned than yeah. than maybe you are, and that probably has to speak to my childhood, and so, and, and I want to earn other people. I'm not saying that I shouldn't earn. You should give it to me, but you got to earn it. I'm no, not saying no, it that no, way. No, like, I understand. Let's 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 get in the mud together, yeah. and let's see if those three hang up, uh, hang together, even when it's messy. Yeah, it's it's interesting because one thing that we didn't talk about with my approach and this nature of the transformation we're taking was is really. Uh, comfort with risk or risk tolerance. And, and I've, as an entrepreneur, have been very comfortable with the fact that, hey, we're going to try some things that are not all going to work perfectly. And so even as it relates to the nature of trust, I will say, I will start. It, I, it is probably born with confidence that even if it goes south, I can solve it or I'm okay with it, you know? And so I have that actually. I have yeah. a high level of self-trust. Right. Like if it goes sideways, I have a deep, like, deep roots that I'll sort that out too. Yeah. yeah. So that way, like, I feel like you can bet on me. I'm going to bet on me that, and I don't say this arrogantly, like I feel like there's a privilege and an honor to be able to be in service in that way for, for people I care right. about. Right. And so you can bet on me because I got these deep roots of we'll, we'll keep going. Like 
<laughs> relentlessly, uncommonly, you know, like we'll keep. So you have a high self-trust. So how does that relate to, to your teammates? I think the sense is that it allows me to transfer that risk. Well, the way I describe it to them is I'm comfortable delegating to you and I will accept the risk. I want you oh, to feel cool. comfortable oh, that's trying cool. it. Yeah. And I'll provide the air cover. Oh, I like Like if that. this doesn't work, I'm the one who's going to say, hey, boss, we tried it. It didn't work. You know, but I don't, cool. I don't want you all to artificially filter things out that I might say, great idea, try it. So, so by saying, look, I'll transfer the risk to me. You try it, I'll accept the risk. That's cool. That's, I like that a lot. Yeah. Okay. So when, when you think about building teams, you're giving trust, I want to say that, and you're right. taking the responsibility for the risk. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, I mean, right. especially as a leader, I would say, you know, the risk is re resident with me. We always say, if it works beautifully, the credit goes to them. Yeah. This is like 101. Exactly. If, ever, if a microphone's yeah. ever in front of you yeah. and there's ever a moment. Like, exactly. And we fail miserably. It was my fault. I yeah, didn't resource right. yeah. them properly or train them properly. Yeah. I should have known better, you know, but, but it's true. I mean, that's how you get teams to trust you too, is to say, your failure is, it, you're never going to be critiqued for trying. What, what is the hardest thing? to be a leader, what is the hardest thing for you in your position as a leader? It's probably the, the lack of downtime. <laughs> I just feel like we're on all the time. Now, yeah. some of that is born by my own doing. I mean, I, I've, I've said to my staff, this is a finite term for me. It's a four year job. And I said, I can stand on my head for four years and I don't wanna leave any stone unturned. I wanna say yes to everything. I wanna do everything. I wanna be everywhere. Because my force, as I mentioned, is all over the world. I want to go thank them for what they're doing where they are. And so the hard part, though, is, look, there are days when at hour 20, I'm exhausted and tired. And it's like, oh, I got this phone call. I forgot. I got to congratulate this person for being selected for promotion or something. And, and I want to do that because those kinds of things are really energizing and fun. You know, like the one-to-one the -one mentoring piece, I, I sprinkle throughout the day. Mm -hmm. um, but it, And it literally is someone every day, you know, either just a short email or a phone call or something, which is atypical, I think, for that's people of my that's rank. That's you know? for you. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So slight transition, mm -hmm. um, keeping with the reservist, and then I want to go to your family. Sure. Um, if we, it's a full circle here. I have a, um, I had a moment, this was maybe about a year ago, and somebody I really trust in business that's been helping me out a bunch. He's inside of Finding Mastery. And he says, I got someone I want you to meet. And I trust his, I trust his judgment in, in, um, in so many ways. And, and I said, okay, great. And I'm excited. And he says, um, he's going to be ideal for everything we're trying to solve together. I said, great. He says, but there's a little thing that I want you to, just to know about. Um, he can't be with you for about 40 days a year. <laughs> I go, what? He goes, yeah, like he's great. But about a month plus, he can't be with you. And so, hold on, we're losing one twelfth of the time right. together. Like, well, does that come off the salary? Like, how does this work? Right. And he goes, no, uh -uh. he's a high performer. You'll see. I go, okay. So I had the meeting. I was like, oh. Is there, he in this room right now? <laughs> <laughs> he's actually in the room. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, so I met him and I was like, um, yeah, there's something different about what he brings to the dance than somebody that is not a reservist. And I wonder if you could, without talking about him like he's mm -hmm. in the room, right, 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 right. <laughs> make it more yeah, awkward yeah, for him yeah. as he's heating up and blushing, wondering right. what is going to happen next. <laughs> um, so he's all in. It was, I yeah. think, one of the great decisions we've made for our company to to hit the ground running and to to kind of take us into a direction that I didn't even know was quite um, available so soon meaning that he right. works with speed and accuracy mm -hmm. um, in really cool ways. So what would you say um, reservists offer employers? Well, I'll tell you what. So Because that's a burden now. Oh, One twelfth oh, of their time is yeah. like a, as an entrepreneur. But, well, let me do you hire, let do me you hire reservists? Oh, you better believe it. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. They, okay, good. That's but, my hopes. But let me yeah. reframe it too. So yeah. the, the weekend a month and two weeks a year, you know, again, unless you guys are working weekends, he's not really gone 30 days. I mean, he's gone mm. for two weeks. That's well, you the know, he has to training. like 
his bags on a Friday okay. and he's got to right. like, okay. you know, like he's got to take a nap on Mondays. <laughs> right. no, I'm, okay. I'm totally joking. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, but the thought that it's uh, a 12th is probably a little high for the average. I mean, the minimum requirement is a weekend a month and two weeks a year. But, but I gave uh, a talk at South by Southwest about this. I mean, long before I was even a flag officer because I felt very passionate about veteran hiring. And the idea was, you know, we have pretty lofty terms that we talk about our core values in the Navy. It's, you know, honor, courage, and commitment. And in the Army, you may have heard, you know, duty, honor, country. And, and you may hear those and go, yeah, okay, um, puffery words. I've heard them all before. My comment to you is they mean something. And they mean something to everyone who wears the uniform. So not only is there an appreciation for some of the soft skills they're going to have good hygiene and show up on time and be responsible and accountable. And, you know, what I learned by hiring a bunch of folks who were young, younger people straight out of college or second jobs out of college was developing culture is very hard. We take it for granted in the military because it's baked into what we do. Replicating that is really hard. When you hire veterans, they know that too. And they're the ones that are going to make it happen. Oh, that's a cool, th right? They're yeah, the cult ones. And culture eats strategy up. for lunch. Absolutely. Right. If you, Absolutely. if you follow that insight, yeah. you know, like that's a cool statement alone. Yeah. I think you could almost stop there. I don't, I don't know if you're going to, but I think you could almost stop there in my mind. Yeah. It's like the first time I, I read this one research article that said those that practice mindfulness have an increased frequency in flow state, which is the most optimal sure. state we can be. Yeah. I'm not going to stop there, but it's like one of those moments where it's like, whoa, is that, can that be replicated? If so. Like that's a yeah. significant finding. So yeah. what I just heard you say is those that come from cultures or organizations that value culture, you're going to get somebody in your organization that understands the value of culture. I, as I say, do you want to be a consumer of culture or a creator of culture? Oh, how about it? Yeah. yeah. So those yeah. folks are going to come in and say, hey, I couldn't help but notice we never do uh, ball games together. Why don't we get together once a month? That's and a do something outside. You know, What's a consumer? Yeah. Consumers like, hey, I'm sitting here. We never do anything fun. Man. You know, hey, are you a baby bird waiting for stuff to fall in your mouth? Oh, my God. You know, or that. yeah. Or are you going to be someone, you know, I always say, create the culture you want to be a part we of. We can't have baby birds. We can't have baby birds. <laughs> it's so That's good. Right. Oh, no. my God. All right. All right. So <laughs> if there was a uh, an equally weighted fast follow on creators of culture, what would be a second fast follow for why hire a reservist? Uh, look, education, training, certification. The Navy is a very technical service. I mean, in all likelihood, whether you're talking officer and enlisted, you're going to get someone with some pretty incredible, incredible competency that walks in the door. So, you know, you are looking for something specific. This is an example where I would say I hire based on potential, not on experience that's what we entirely. Do as well. Yeah. yeah. And, mm -hmm. and that's one of those things where I would say you have demonstrated teamwork. You've been part of, uh, of either a mission or a unit that has a function. Where did you fit in? What was your role? And and what does that look like as you need it? I mean, there's a million ways that I think you benefit. And some of it is just soft skills. Again, accountability and responsibility. It's hard to teach that to young kids. It's easy if someone walks in the door saying, I was a platoon sergeant and I was responsible for folks on missions in Afghanistan. Now, not everyone's going to be, you know, a bronze star wearing a uh, war hero, but but even in peacetime, the responsibilities for safety and training are pretty, uh, pretty onerous. So anyway, those things translate, I think. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Now, if we kind of fold back around before we get to family is command and control, mm -hmm. this idea of like top down leadership. I don't want to build an organization that way. And that is the organizations that, that you all have found to be significant in, um, for all the reasons that sure. the military and the Navy is, is what it is. Can you, can you help me think about um, if we could wave a wand mm -hmm. and we're a team of, let's say, a couple hundred to a couple thousand, could you imagine a different way of doing it? Or does this seem like, listen, I've been swing, swimming in this water for so long. I, I know the, the assets and the power of top down, and I don't, want, yeah. I don't even want to entertain another way. Well, first, I would say the military has what we call Napoleonic uh, organization codes. So, you know, and N for Navy, you know, N1 is manpower and personnel, and two is intelligence, three is operations, you know, four is logistics, five is plans, et cetera, six communication, seven is uh, training. So, and that's, they're called Napoleonic codes because he came up with it. So it, we're a couple hundred years in run on this stuff. And uh, are we ready for evaluation? 
I, I think so. I mean, part of this is the way we really operate today is we have Napoleonic codes for administrative functions, but then we have matrix organizations for operational functions. Because you need to know, if I need new yellow stickies, who do I go to? You know, you need a supply officer that's going to handle that for you. That's different than launch the uh, alert five strike, you know. So, so anyway, we see differences in the way we're organized. In many cases, we're dealing with joint task forces, which are uh, multi-service and, uh, and multi-nation. So it's not enough for us to roll in and go, hey, here's how the U.S. Navy operates, you know, because the Italians and the French and the Germans and the Brits are going to say, we do it differently. Um, so, so we all take a little bit from one another, particularly in, in NATO and joint environments too. Um, back to your real question, I've always looked at how many direct reports am I comfortable with? And so I, I as a civilian C-suite uh, executive, say I want as flat an organization as I can possibly manage. I couldn't do it with a couple thousand, but I would certainly say I want to have no more than 10 just because I don't feel that I could really give the attention to those 10 and the functions that I'm assigning to them that I want to be really engaged with. Do you feel like a teammate across those 10? Absolutely. Or do you yeah. feel like you do? Yeah. It's not like you're my team and like I'm part of your team. I, I just have a different job. I, I have a different responsibility. I feel that way. I'm sure my staff would say, yeah, but he's not. But, but, you know? right. yeah. I mean, I, I look, I want to be involved. I also recognize the need for my folks, to, for them to spread their wings. If I'm there, even when I say, okay, we're all, you know, parking rank at the door. This is a working session. Roll your sleeves up. I just know if I'm in the room that everyone defers to me and I, and I don't want them to necessarily. So yeah. sometimes the best I can do is back to your question about style. We refer to something called mission command, which is a, a decentralized approach where we say, Here's the mission we're trying to accomplish. If everybody's good with that, I'll get out of the way and you all figure it out and then tell me what you need for me to help. Meaning I'm not going to give you instruction manual for every decision you're going to make. I trust you and, and you're responsible for it. We all agree that we are laddering up to this mission and you each have a role and function and I'm standing by to support. Next time you come back to me, tell me either what you need or that you're done. I love that. Yeah. I love I it fits so much more an entrepreneurial approach for me right. than, yeah. yeah. And I, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's the antithesis of micromanagement. I, yeah. And again, it's, right. it is predicated on a couple of things. One is absolute trust. You know, you have to be confident. I have to be, as a leader, confident that my people understand what, when we say the mission, do we all have a shared understanding of what it is we're trying to accomplish? Two, do I have the trust that they can do it? Are they equipped? Are they capable? Are they trained? You know, is it possible for them to do what I'm asking of them? They may say, I got it, boss, I'm good, which may be false bravado if I go, really, how are you going to do that? You don't even have any of the equipment you need. So, so the trust piece is important. And then the other thing that I like to do is take my subordinate commanders together frequently to have conversations almost like this off the record where, I mean, I have a monthly session with my, we call them echelon three commanders, where, where we have an hour, just us, no one else on the line, where, where we talk about, hey, what's going on in your life? What, what's happening? What's making your head hurt? What can I help you with? Anything I should know? And, and it's really for me to say, you guys haven't heard this yet, but this is coming down the pipe. I'm about to announce this new policy or something else that's going to impact you all. Or if, hey, the three of us uh, or the three of you talked about this and gave me a recommendation, I, I appreciate your input, but we're doing something different. I want you to know why. Because... That, you know, this originated with Horatio Nelson, you know, Lord Nelson the, of the British Navy, so that his commanders could operate in his absence. I said, if we talk enough, then you know where my head is and you know is how Is this I'm where talking. commander's intent came from? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Is your intent clear for your direct reports? I, I sure hope so. And I try very hard to make and sure how, it is. How do, you, how do you get to clarity? So we have a number of mechanisms where we release executive orders. They call it XORD. Um, I've, I've put out a number of directives that say, here's what we're doing. You know, like, here's what we need to be ready to do by 2025. Here's what we have to be ready to do by 2027. I published a, a document called Battle Orders 2032, which is assuming we do everything in the fighting instructions that I published, here's what the world will look like when it's all done. 
Whoa. You know, and, and the reason I did that was I got feedback. You know, we had 130 wow. tasks that we were, you know, we were attacking with, with uh, vigor. And folks said, I, I get the change. I just don't see how they all tie together. Oh, and and I said, cool. okay, so I'm going to write this, this separate document that says, here's the glimpse of the future that's in my head when we're doing all this stuff. So commander's intent for me, you know, I think about leader's intent, not obviously not commander's right. intent in the civilian world, but it feels like what you just outlined is here's the mission or here's the objectives that we're going right. after. Is, I think there's another component that gets confusing for me, which is how to operate when things break down. Yeah. So that that type of intent on decision making, choice making, what what is in and what is out for being able to accomplish it when the system goes sideways, we're in the messy right. middle. How do you get clarity on that? Because it, now you're outside of an SOP, a standard operating sure. you know, sure. procedure. You're 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 in the the unfolding unknown. Yeah. So how do you I get mean, there's, intent there's there? There's so many potential variables uh, that I could attack in the answer, but but what I would say is. Depending on the severity of the decision point, there are many things where I would say you are authorized to make these decisions. In, in some cases, the way we work it is you can say yes to everything, but only I can say no. So I imagine if a four-star admiral comes to the reserve force and says, I need something. I don't want one of my lieutenant commanders to say, no, admiral. You know? Right. So, so I say, you want to say yes? No problem. I reserve the right to say no. Um, I mean, that's one example. But if you're describing something that is operational mission and things are going sideways, that's a different story. You know, in some cases, we're not subject to debate. We're kind of taking direction from the leader and we'll talk about it when the mission's over. But right now you need to move. Um, you know, this isn't a good time for us to have a conversation about why. So you so you get through you right. That's a forcing function for you right. to become clear and translate that those ideas. Writing is one of those. Right. And then how do you get clarity like yourself? So, um, well, I mean, I have the benefit of just uh, drinking from a fire hose of policy documents and uh, future state uh, discussions. And, you know, we're doing a force design review for the Navy of 2045. And, you know, as, as we're reading all this stuff, I, my reaction, of course, is what's the reserve inject on this? And what do I need to be thinking today? So that by 2045, we are ready to deliver what's being committed to. Why 2045? Um, it's, it's, it's even mind blowing. I, I, I don't, I don't think yeah. in those terms, which is no, really no. Cool. Well, it's interesting. I mean, we do a 30 year shipbuilding plan, you know, and that's because one, you know, like aircraft carriers, it takes between five and six years to build one. So you need to commit early. How long early. does it take China to build one? Um, well, they're building their third. It will probably take them about five, but, uh, but th so they, they bought one from Russia okay. and then they built one that was a copy of that. So the, the first two are, you know, kind of B minus, uh, craft. The third one they're building is equivalent to our Nimitz class. So that, that's a legit, uh, carrier, but, but it's still going to be a couple of years. Okay. But yeah. in general, they can produce faster than we can. Well, they've got more yards. So their capacity is greater. I, I mean, at some point, this is one of those things where I'd say, you know, you can't put nine ladies in a room and make a baby in one month. Got so, it. so even if, um, you know, <laughs> sorry, know, sorry. So they have more shipyards, so they could build more ships simultaneously. It doesn't mean that they can build one ship faster. I see. Yeah. I see how that works. Okay. It's still important variable. Yeah. That, that oh, capacity. Yeah. capacity. Okay. Definitely. So family. Oh, uh, yes. Um, the Mustin family, like, <laughs> like, we, we hinted on the legacy, the generational legacy that you have. Did When you were growing up, and maybe even now, do you feel that there's a shadow or a spotlight that creates a tension for you? Or is this the handoff that they've given to you is like, a, I'm, I'm running faster than I ever could on my own, and it's more um, generative in that way? I always thought... Um well, first, as a young man, I mean, I was really fortunate that my grandfather, who was a career naval officer, Naval Academy graduate, was still alive uh, through through my early entry into the Navy. So my high school, World War college, uh, he was a World War II veteran, yeah. Um, and and his stories were legendary. So part of what I remember was, you know, sitting around the table at uh, Thanksgiving or cocktail parties, and his friends would come to these parties, and I was just a very eager listener when they were recounting these stories of heroism in World War II and the Pacific, and granddad was telling the story of, 
his ship in a night battle that sunk. And, you know, General Condon, who was the guy that taught me how to play golf, who, you know, was a, a running mate of a guy named Pappy Boeington. I don't know if you ever saw Baba Black Sheep, but uh, legendary Marine aviator. And so these folks were talking about what they did. And I just always thought, I would be honored to be a part of that kind of conversation. And then when I would talk to my friends or be at my friends' families and and I, I didn't see conversations like that, you know. And so then then I would notice my father and his friends who were Vietnam and Cold War era folks, same kind of stories. There we were in the Kola Peninsula looking down the throat of the Russians and, you know, and I thought, this is some pretty heady real world stuff. And it's um and, I, and I'm just fortunate to be privy to this. I mean, one time when I was a midshipman at the Naval Academy, and this is a funny story, that the house I live in now is the house that my parents lived in. When, and so it's quarters at the Washington Navy Yard, but it's the same quarters that I lived in when I was a midshipman. Um, but I came home unannounced one time, and I walked in, basically opened up the door. I was like, hey, mom, dad, I'm home. And I look in the living room, and my father is there in uniform, standing with the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and two folks with a big chart on our living room sofa pointing to something. And 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 I walked in, I was like, um, am I interrupting? <laughs> As they kind of drop a curtain over the chart, you yeah, know? Yeah, and I said, yeah. yeah, I'll get out of here okay. right now. Uh -huh. but, but so I saw this and, and on one hand kind of took it for granted. And I thought, hey, this is neat. You know, our parents, our grandparents, parents, uncle, great grandparents, we serve. And that's what we do. At, but it's at the high, you're being humble. It's at the highest level. I mean, it's a family of vice admirals. Right. Admirals. Well, they, so they were career, uh, career officers. And, right. and so I remember but at the highest level. Well, I mean, they were, yeah, they were fortunate to, <laughs> to, to continue to serve. I mean, uh, they had was, some great jobs. Great grandfather was his tag. He passed away as a captain. Yeah. So he was the one, yeah, they called him the father of naval aviation. So, so is this a spotlight or is this a shadow that, and, I mean, I was always very proud. Yeah, so there, you proud. Did, you never felt so it's not shadow. You didn't, you weren't operating the shadows of legends. Well, of tall I mean, trees. I, I would I don't typically volunteer this. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I, my sense was because of that. I don't know what everyone thinks, but my assumption is they're going to think this guy thinks he's got uh, an in, or he's not going to have to work as hard. You know, I went to the Naval Academy and as a plebe, as soon as people found out, oh wait a minute, your dad's an admiral. Okay, it's not good to be a plebe at the Naval Academy with when your father's an admiral because everyone's what is plebe? Uh, freshman. Okay. Freshman. And so my view was always, you know what? I'm going to try that much harder, and I'm just going to be the best, and then there won't be any discussion. So no one will have to worry about, okay, you know, did someone cut him slack or not? Uh, my view was, let's just make it so apparent that hey, I was selected based on performance. He gets after it. Right. End of sentence. Right. Yeah. So okay. And you didn't feel the heat from that spotlight. Like, I have to be great because of I may the be, legacy. I, I may have felt some of that. Um, I mean, let's put it this way. I, I want to earn it. And and I want to set a good example for my kids. Yeah, so that's what you did is like you you took you took back your control by saying, what, what can I do here? I can apply myself to my fullest. Right. And now I'm guiding the way ex I experienced me being me in this world of people that I don't care how they're thinking about me as much as I care about how I'm applying myself. Absolutely. Maybe that's the clarity yeah. I was looking for. And, and, and honestly, I, I, I think there's going to be a time when I'm dead and buried and, and I would love for people to speak of me the same way they speak of my father and grandfather. Oh, that's yeah. cool. What do you hope they say? Um, made a difference. You know, I say like the greatest legacy we're going to leave is our children and the people that we trained. You know, I'll have, 20 years of officers and sailors that uh, that have been part of my staffs and commands that will be doing great things way after I'm gone. And and if they continue to do great things, then that's probably the best reflection of my contribution. Vice Admiral John Mustin, <laughs> thank you so much for like an absolute masterclass in leadership and thoughtfulness and clarity of idea and thinking about how to do it at scale. So. Thank you for coming through to the Mastery Lab today. It's my honor, and I am so excited to have met you. And actually, as I said, for uh, having been a life, like long, year-long listener or years-long listener, uh, thrilled to be a part of this. Yeah, yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Thanks.